Okay, recording in progress. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on OPAC's talk on bullying with our special guest speaker, Barbara Colorazzo. This is the second time she's spoken. She spoke earlier this year on Parenting Through Crisis, and now she's back to speak about bullying, which is such a always a relevant topic, especially now as we prepare to send our kids back to school. And uh, Barbara, for those who don't know, she's an internationally renowned parenting expert, author, speaker, and also a childhood cancer survivor mom. And you can check out more of her work, her books, and excellent resources on our website, kidsareworthit.com. So Barbara, um, if you wanted to start. Sure, thank you very much, um, uh, Sarah. Uh, it's, a, it's a joy to be here again uh, and having a personal connection with this, having had a daughter at 17 who had a rare form of follicular carcinoma, uh, very much like the children in Chernobyl. She's done well. She's a, a mom and um, uh, has uh, very little residual other than constantly getting her T cells checked, which doesn't hurt with COVID going around. So it is a joy and an honor to be here to present for such a great group uh, of people dealing with what we live through. Um, and I went through the different passages and the like that we go through when we first get that diagnosis, the, the oh no of it all and the, the um, intense sorrow and then the sadness and then the joy of getting on with life. Uh, and then whipping right back around that when you get a, a, another diagnosis or a relapse and the like. However, with you all having kids starting school, one of the issues uh, for so many uh, parents today is the issue of bullying. So I wanna talk about what it is and what it isn't, what to look for as a parent, um, and what you can do productively as a parent and what not to do. And all of you will have access to this. This is a handout. It's a 68 page uh, handout uh, on um, the bully, the bully, the not so innocent bystander. What I did was took my book and condensed it down so you don't have such a heavy read. Um, and you can go to very specific kinds of things very quickly. And you also have the mini version of that. Uh, so let's start with uh, what bullying is and what it isn't. Uh, this is one of the biggest mistakes educators make and I'm finding that parents are at a loss as well. I know there was a question asked, uh, what do you do if your child who has cancer is bullying his or her siblings? And my very first question would be, uh, is it really bullying or is it striking out in anger and frustration and hurt? world of difference. So let's look at the difference. Um, and educators often make the mistake and saying things like boys be boys, girls just want to be mean, it's part of growing up, or he's just flirting with you, or she must like you when she's being mean. Um, so let's look at the difference. Two kids fighting over a TV program. That is normal. It's natural. It's necessary. Children need to learn to handle their conflicts non-violently. So that's our job is to help them handle it. But it has nothing to do with bullying. So let's look first at normal, natural, and necessary conflict. Be it in the schoolyard or in, at home. Two kids fighting over a TV program. Now there are three kinds of families, but you will also find there are three kinds of schools. The brick wall, the jellyfish, and the backbone. The brick wall, stop it, stop it, stop it. Turn that set off. Nobody's watching it which says to the children, you have a conflict and I'm going to solve it for you because I don't like conflict and I don't want it happening. Children never learn to handle their own conflicts that way. Jellyfish, oh, your brothers and sisters, you're supposed to love one another. Don't do this to me, which also says um, you don't have to solve it yourself, but I'm invoking pity here, which we don't want to do. But a backbone parent, remember a backbone parent has flexibility you don't get from the brick wall, but it also gives you an environment that's conducive to creative, constructive, and responsible activity you don't get from a jellyfish. Uh, so a backbone parent understands the slower you walk, the quieter you are, the better your chances of it being over before you get there, and you will not have to deal with it. But if it's still going on, 
you gently turn the set off, take the remote, and you say you're both fighting. You can turn this TV back on when you both have a plan. Now, what we have done is put it on the children. And you say, now, what do I need? And they all oh, plan. They never say it nicely. Oh, dad, we need a plan. So don't count on it. But one of three things will happen when you leave it up to them. They'll share. They'll both get up and leave it. Or one of them will come up with a plan they both can live with. As long as the one who came up with a plan doesn't use brute force or intimidation. I mean, if one says, I'm going to beat you up. You don't let me watch this program. You have to say, that's not a good plan. You can come up with a better one. Uh, instead of lecturing them, we don't talk that way. They, they just did. No, that's not a good plan. And pretty soon they realize you're very serious about the fact that you believe they can handle it. But if one says, you let me watch this program today, you can have two tomorrow. Now you and the older kid know tomorrow is Saturday, nothing's on, don't say a word. This is not the teachable moment. It comes the next day when the other child says, it's not fair. There's nothing on. We often interfere the day before and say that's not fair. And it is interference. Uh, and the other child never learns to handle their own conflicts. And I've got to tell you, when you have a child dealing with cancer treatment, we may be inclined to rescue them and not put them through the pain of their own consequences. If it's not life-threatening, morally threatening, or unhealthy, let it go. Let them experience uh, and empower them, letting them know, even with a cancer diagnosis, I have power here in my life. They need to feel that agency. It's so important uh, to understanding their own cancer, age appropriate, ability appropriate, and also understanding the treatment they're undergoing. That gives them agency. Also letting them fo to, uh, follow through on the choices they made is also saying to them, I believe you're capable. And I just say to the, the younger one, I noticed you're giving in to your brother a lot. Would you like to learn a few good lines? And you teach them the lines. Like I'm willing to let you watch this program today if I can have one on Monday and one on Tuesday and I want it in writing. You teach that young person to do, do that, nobody's gonna walk all over him. But that's conflict. That's normal, it's natural, and it's necessary. But the 10-year-old has the five-year-old's arm up the back. We're not talking to yoga pose here, kids in serious pain screaming at the top of his lungs. You rush in there, and as soon as your daughter sees you, she drops her brother's arm and starts comforting him. We say, what are you screaming like that for? And the way your daughter looks at your son, because bullying has to do with uh, intimidation. He knows if he says anything right now, since bullying happens under the radar of adults, he's going to be in a heap of lot of trouble after you leave. So he weighs the odds and he says, oh, nothing, mom, nothing. Well, then quit screaming like that. We have just retargeted the target. But step back a moment. When you walk in there, you saw something you wished you hadn't seen. You saw your daughter smile before she saw you. That smile is called a smirk. Um, uh, she knew she was hurting her brother and getting pain from it, which is what bullying is, a conscious, willful, deliberate, hostile activity intended to harm where you get pleasure from somebody else's pain. Now, there are four ways and three means to do that bullying. Now, I'm going to go back to the child whose parent may have been concerned that a child who had been diagnosed with cancer um, is striking out in what appears to be a bullying thing. If they weren't bullying before, chances of them bullying now is pretty slim. Uh, they're striking out. Uh, they're angry and they're frustrated and you'll see them striking out. It's not uncommon, but that is not bullying. Um, uh, making an expression uh, of hurt and frustration and using swear words. Unless it's directed at somebody, that's not bullying. Um, and so we've got to be sure we understand what it is. So there are four ways and three means. The four ways, one, and I've been fighting with school districts since 2000, and many of them have uh, changed their bullying uh, policies, is it can be a one-time significant event. How often teachers will say, well, it must be continuous and repeated over time to be bullying. Once in the toilet counts. Once called a gross sexual term is mean and cruel. 
once pushing somebody uh, out of a place in the lunchroom is mean and cruel. Once ostracizing them online is mean and cruel. Bullying's about mean and cruel. So it can be a one-time significant event. The second is the most common, continuous and repeated over time. The third is hazing, which is still going on. We just had a major case in the United States uh, with that at a high school um, uh, where a two freshmen were horribly uh, traumatized with the hazing that they underwent, all forms of hazing, uh, where you have to um, do something that's denigrating or it's done to you or humiliating or dehumanizing in order to get into the group. And how often people say, but they agreed to do it. The need to belong is so important for young people, it, for all of us, in fact, we need to feel like we're connected that sometimes, especially younger kids, will do anything to get into a group. So all forms of hazing um, are bullying. And the, the fourth one is the one all of us struggled with during uh, COVID-19, and we will continue to struggle with um, when they get to in-person learning. And that cyber technology uh, enhanced or digital bullying. Um, it's called all three of those. Uh, but online and offline have now merged to become what is the real world for our young people. We used to say the online world and the real world. Well, we can't say that anymore. It's online, offline, merged. So we have the four ways. Now, there are three means to do those four ways. The first is the most common, verbal bullying. Boys and girls do that one equally well. You know, the adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me is a lie. Just ask Dawn Marie Wesley's mom. Dawn Marie hung herself with her dog's leash at 14, left a suicide note naming the three girls who had only verbally tormented her every single day in middle school. The two tools they used, cell phone and the internet. The last thing Dawn Marie Wesley heard was one of those girls saying, we'd all be better off if you were dead. And by morning she was. Verbal bullying can impact somebody as greatly, if not more profoundly than physical bullying. Um, there's a book called The Ethics of Memory and the researcher in the book studied people who had been physically tortured and found using functional MRI machines that the pain of the injury, unless it was permanent, the pain of the injury experienced during the torture, uh, that pain faded over time. However, the pain of the insult never went away. In fact, at times would grow. So he decided to look and see if people are isolated, uh, which is uh, one of the forms of bullying, uh, shunning rumor, gossip, and exclusion, or verbally tormented. He wondered what it would look like in a functional MRI machine. Well, there was no pain of the injury. But the pain of the insult was as great, if not greater, than for people who had been physically tortured. So we cannot dismiss the verbal bullying or the social relational bullying, the shunning rumor, gossip, and exclusion. Verbal bullying alone can pack a tremendous wallet, be an entree to the other two, or combine with the other two for an even greater wallet. Um, and so we have to watch it, not just dismiss it. Oh, that's just how kids talk today. No, somebody calls another human being a derogatory term. We need to be on top of that, not dismiss it as boys are we boys, girls just want to be mean, or maybe she's flirting with you. Um, we have to nail it for the mean and cruel that it truly is. Uh, so verbal bullying alone can pack a tremendous wallop, be an entree to the other two, or combine with the other two for an even greater wallop. The second is social and relational bullying uh, that girls do far better than boys do. Uh, and that is that shunning rumor, gossip, and exclusion. Boys can do it, they just are less inclined to do it. Because they tend to do the physical bullying. Um, the physical, now very few boys actually resort to physical bullying. They threaten it, but that's verbal bullying. They fight a lot, but that's not even bullying. And a smaller number of girls resort to physical bullying, but they don't have to. 
they have in their social arsenal that social and relational bullying, shunning, rumor, gossip, and exclusion. So if we look at those three uh, means of doing the four ways of bullying, we look at what bullying is. It's a conscious, willful, deliberate, hostile activity intended to harm where you get pleasure from somebody else's pain. When two kids are fighting, they're angry and upset, both of them. They want something. When kids are involved in a bullying scenario, the one child targets the other child. One is upset, sometimes terrorized. The other one is getting pleasure from the pain. Now, the title of my work is The Bully, the Bullied, and the Not-So-Innocent Bystander. William Burroughs said it so beautifully. There are no innocent bystanders. What were they doing there? in the first place. And it's so important that you and your children from age five on recognize, and you'll see in the handout, the bully circle, uh, where they may get locked in that trap of comradeship as Sebastian Hafner called it, defying Hitler. Uh, they get caught in it when they had no intention of being mean and cruel. Martin Buber said, I am I and you are thou. I'm unique and you're unique. And we have a common humanity. I work with teachers on a regular basis, trying to get them to have a classroom climate that's rooted in deep caring. I tell children, you don't have to like every kid in that classroom, but you must honor their humanity, treat them with dignity and regard. In bullying, I'm an I, you're an it. And that's where the verbal abuse can come in, the beginnings of the dehumanization. Um, and you say, oh my goodness, I can't believe someone would target uh, a kid who has cancer. Well, it's hard to believe that anyone would be mean and cruel and laugh at somebody else's pain in any way. But any child who looks different um, or behaves differently than what the bully is expecting is at risk. You'd be tired because you're new, you're short, you're tall, you developed early, you developed late, your race, religion, gender, physical or mental ability, your economic status, you can be targeted because you have an allergy, you can be targeted because you're on chemo, you can be targeted because your hair is gone. And you say, well, how, how cruel, because you would not do it. Most kids who are targeted are very caring, loving human beings who would never do it to another person. And that's what's so devastating to the kid who has it done to them. They can't understand why somebody's being that mean and cruel. Why do bullies bully? They bully because they can. And they've been taught. There's a song from South Pacific, you have to be carefully taught to hate before you're six, seven, or eight, to hate the people your relatives hate. Bullying is a learned behavior. And we can go a long way toward teaching kids. You don't have to like somebody, but you must honor their humanity. And we cannot be laughing at somebody else's pain. So let's look at, at teasing and taunting, and we'll get back to the bully circle in a moment. But teasing and taunting, um, all the girls are laughing, one girl's crying. We were just teasing, all the boys are laughing, one boy's fighting back tears. We were just teasing, you know what I say to them? You lie, you lie, you lie, and then your parents come in and say, you said my son lied. He did, he was taunting someone. I've also had little ones come up and say, they were teasing me. Their whole body is speaking pain. And I'll say, I bet they weren't. I'll bet they were taunting you because you wouldn't be crying if they were teasing. Because teasing is lighthearted, clever, and benign. Teasing is laughing with someone. It's important for relationships to be able to laugh. Now, some of that laughter, and you may find this with your child who has cancer, will be some gallows humor and you go, oh my goodness, but it's still a laughing with, not a laughing at. And sometimes they do it just to shock you. Uh, and then you look at the humor they've had. It was gallows humor. It was not at anybody. It was mocking the cancer. And that is such a healthy thing to be doing. So in teasing, it's mutual. I tease you, you can tease me. In taunting, I taunt you, you better not taunt me back. In teasing, uh, you might be better at verbal, but I find those birthday candles that won't blow out. Um, and so we may tease in different ways, but we're both laughing with one another. Now, what about kids who all gather together to laugh at a child? That's taunting, even if there are other kids laughing with the, the kid doing the bullying. Um, in teasing, it's intended to get both parties 
to laugh. It's lighthearted, clever, and benign. In taunting, it's intended to laugh at the other child who's being targeted. And um, it's bigoted comments thinly disguised as jokes. In teasing, it's only a small part of your relationship. You're not teasing all the time. In taunting, it is the relationship. I'm here to verbally torment you, and I might socially and relationally torment you, and then I may physically tor torment you if I can get away with the other two. Um, and it, so it's very one-sided. In teasing, all of us, including with your own children and a child who has cancer, you might be trying to make lighthearted of what they're going through just to help lighten the, the atmosphere there. Um, and uh, you made a mistake. They just aren't handling right now. And tear comes down their eye. What do you do? You stop right away. What do bullies do? They keep going. That's why I always marvel when a teacher says to a young child, just tell them, please stop. That hurts. Oh, good. That will not work. That's exactly what the bully wants. And we see that far too often in anti-bullying programs. So you don't ever want your child to tell the bully, please stop, that hurts. We want them to be able to roll their shoulders around and down, stand strong and say, that was mean and cruel. I don't need this, I'm out of here. It puts the problem back on the person doing the bullying and helps a young person take care of themselves. And hopefully there'll be some adult that they feel safe in telling. And I've got to tell you, more often than not, it's a parent before they'll tell a teacher. Um, if you can help young people understand, and in your handouts, I've given you the two lists of teasing and taunting, uh, you might want to look at uh, uh, developing that by the time they reach grade four, because by grade four, then you can move into the difference between flirting, and you say, oh my goodness, that young, mm -hmm. flirting, which is normal, natural, and necessary, and helps keep the human race going, and sexual bullying, which is none of that. Because if you look at the checklist for teasing, it's very close to verbal uh, flirting. If you look at the taunting, um, it's very close to sexual bullying. And so we wanna help lay that foundation very young. And some of you might be playing catch up here, but that's all right. Kids pick things up very quickly when they have the terminology. I have young people, even after just doing one lecture with them on the difference between teasing and taunting, come up to me and say, well, that boy was, and they go to say, te is taunting me. And I say, you got the word right, because that's what he was doing. Um, and so we need to help our young people have the vocabulary there. Now, let's look at that bully circle. In the center, you have the kid who was targeted, which can be your child. Um, and uh, kids who have been uh, doing virtual learning, you may think have been safe from it. I have three grandchildren that did virtual learning this year. Um, Adriana, who is 13, um, and she is missing out on middle school, and she missed that social relationship. Our 12-year-old, Chance, um, actually was comfortable with virtual learning and enjoyed his little pod who now that he's back to, to in-person learning, they're very much connected. And then we have Dominic who is 10 and he thrived in virtual learning because he wasn't so readily extracted, uh, distracted. Um, and he was a little fearful of going back to school. So you might find in your own family that you have uh, a kid in middle school who really wants to get back into the social life. And then one who's just either way, it's fine, pretty easy going. And one who really thrived during that time and is a little fearful. Recognize it, let them speak it to you. Now also remember we speak five ways, our bodies, our face, our eyes, our tone of voice, and what we actually say. Only 20% of what we communicate is done with words. The other 80% is what our bodies do and when those words are being spoken or not spoken. It's like a little third grade boy had a teacher who didn't like third grade boys and the kid and the elder on say, you don't like third grade boys. And the teacher looked down and said, that's not true. I like third grade boys. And the, the kid looked back up and said, would you tell your face that then? Because the body was speaking something different. Your children will know when you're scared. Your children will know when you're um, concerned. And so you need to be upfront and honest, especially with a child who has cancer. Uh, they want to know 
um, that you're there for them and it's okay to be scared themselves and it's okay to be concerned and worried. Uh, but the final thing we have to say to a young person is we're gonna get through this together. We're gonna get through this because we can. There's an old Sufi saying, remember in the good times and the bad, this too will pass. And so you're going to have those good times and rough times. And we have to be there for our children and say, we're gonna get through this together because I believe you are capable of getting through this. I, I think I told all of you in the, the session on parenting through crisis that I was saying to my daughter's uh, physician, that how I wished it had been me going through this. And he looked at me and he said, what, don't you think your child's capable of handling her own life issues? It was like, uh, he said, your job is to be there for her. Um, it is her journey, it's not yours. Uh, and you're along to be there to be supportive. Um, and so we need to do that even if your child has been targeted. Um, and some of them may have been targeted virtually because it's quite possible and hopefully uh, the educators caught that on screen. Um, but if not, uh, and they can share with you what's happened, then you know you need to deal with it and let the school know what's going on. But now you know the four ways and three means, and you know the difference between conflict and bullying, you'll be better equipped to be able to speak uh, to those who um, are in uh, taking care of your children while they're in school. Uh, so let's look at that bully circle. In the center is a child. Anyone can be targeted, but a child who has any differences in cancer would be a major difference in a child's life uh, can be at high risk. Uh, but again, anyone can be targeted. The problem is with the person doing the targeting, not with the child who was targeted. And that's why I use the term target as opposed to victim. Uh, they were targeted by those who would bully them. Now, these are only roles kids are playing and they can move out of in and out of these roles. The problem is if they stay in these roles, they can become what is known as a character actor, um, where the bully doesn't develop good friendship skills, doesn't learn to relate to anyone in a give and take relationship uh, and the like. And a targeted kid will begin to feel beaten down and will become more vulnerable as time goes by. If I would say to you, Henry Winkler, you might think the Fonz, but he's also a Shakespearean actor and he writes children's books. But we see him in one way. And what we don't want is for people to see our child as a target and extremely vulnerable, or as somebody who would be mean and cruel to somebody. We need to deal with it. So we have at the top, the kid who would target another kid. Right below them is the henchman. Um, now you didn't raise your kid to be a henchman, but you raised them to do to please. Um, and they pleased you when they were younger but they're pleasing their peers now that they're older and peer influence is stronger. Um, I've had so many parents come up to me and say, but he was such a good kid. He was so well behaved, so well liked, so well mannered. Now look at him. And I look at him and I get to know the parents. They say, you know what? He hasn't changed. They go, what? Hasn't changed. From the time he was little, he dressed the way you told him to dress. He acted the way you told him to act, said the things you told him to say. He's been listening to somebody else tell him what to do. It's, he's been doing it. He hasn't changed. He's still listening to somebody else tell him what to do. Problem is, isn't you anymore. It's his peers. So this is our henchman. When the high status social bully says to all the other girls, I don't like the new girl. You want to be in my group? Don't eat lunch with her. The henchman will be the one to put the backpack down on the chair because she wants to fit in with the bully. Um, and not allow the new girl to sit there. The active supporter will video that and then post it on Instagram for others to laugh at the young girl's pain. The next girl is the passive supporter. They're the ones who take that off of Instagram and laugh in the car about, ho, ho, look what happened to that new girl. Uh, that's getting pleasure. They're still part of the problem, getting pleasure from somebody else's pain. At the very bottom is a deadly lot, which can be you and me or educators, the disengaged onlooker who turns a blind eye and say, oh, boys be boys, girls just want to be mean, as part of growing up. Uh, and Or they're older or younger and say, it's not my problem. 
On the upswing is a potential witness. That's a kid you did raise to act with integrity and civility and compassion, but they're afraid to step in. They're afraid if they step in, they'll make it worse for the target. They're afraid to step in, they'll be targeted next. They're afraid because they don't know what to do. They're just simply afraid, but they are still a part of the problem. At the very top is the antithesis of the bully, the brave-hearted kid, the witness, resistor, and defender, kid willing to stand up, speak out, step in, do the right thing when the burden's heavy. It's that young girl who goes and sits next to the new girl. Um, and uh, uh, knows that she will do that at cost. She's not going to get scratch and sip stickers and stars, catch them being good awards. What she'll probably get is, oh, Miss Goody Two Shoes, or you're next. And that young boy in the locker room, when all the other kids are mocking a boy because of their race, religion, gender, physical or mental ability, economic status. Um, and the one boy steps in and says, back off, leave him alone. He's probably going to get what are you, chicken? What do you just like him? But that's the kid I'd like your kid to be. Is that kid willing to stand up and speak out, step in and do the right thing? The interesting thing you'll see with siblings of kids who have cancer is they may grow very protective, which is not a bad thing. Uh, and be willing to stand up and speak out, which says, you know, I can count on my brother or sister to do that. You may be surprised if your kid was a very caring, sensitive human being before the cancer, she may still during her cancer treatment and maybe not in spite of it, but all that she is learning through it, be that one to stand up for the other kid and step in and do the right thing when the burden is heavy. Uh, now let's look at why kids don't tell us. Um, there are uh, several reasons kids don't tell. One, they're ashamed. Most targeted kids are caring and sensitive and never would do that to another kid because they can't figure out why somebody taunting me about my hair or the lack of hair or that scar that I have or that pump that I have to wear. Uh, and they can't change that and they can't figure out why. So they feel ashamed of what's happening to them. And that's why we have to stop bullying in its track because that shame is from the external. And we don't want our kid to ever feel shame for what's going on in their own bodies, their skin color, um, their allergy that they may have, that they're shorter, they're taller, developed early or developed late. Um, see, conflict, we resolve bullying, we have to stop. Uh, so they're ashamed. They're afraid of retaliation. This is a real fear. Uh, because bullies uh, know uh, to intimidate. You see, bullying, there's always an imbalance of power, whether it's perceived or actual for size, position, status, uh, and the like. But there's always an imbalance of power. There's an intent to harm. That's a smirk on the face. And there's a threat of further aggression. Even if it's only happened once, the child can anticipate it happening again if it's not been stopped and dealt with effectively. Um, and then if that goes unabated, you've got terror. You've got a kid afraid to go to school. And so it's so important that we stop it in its tracks. No more, not here, never. That was mean, that was cruel. In this place, whether it's our home, the car, or at school, this is safe harbor for every child. Your children need to hear that. And the schools need to be able to express that as the people who are teaching or the aides on the playground and the like the person in the lunchroom um, overhear somebody laughing at somebody to be able to nail them. Me, that's mean, that's cruel. And I need to see you after because uh, that's not tolerated here. And you've got some work to do. So they're, they're fearful of retaliation. They don't think anyone can help them because we have this idea if we don't see it, we're not gonna deal with it. Well, right off dealing with bullying because bullying tends to happen under the radar of adults. And if you have the attitude, if I don't see it, I can't deal with it. Look at their body language. It will be speaking pain if they're telling you, which is hard to do in the first place, but they're telling you that somebody has done that to them. If Now, if a bully who wants to get somebody in trouble it's involuntary, they'll have that smirk on their face. So watch for it. Um, but they're afraid that nobody can help them. They don't think anyone will help them because when the child is reported, just like they were told to, 
they get things like walk down another hallway, find another place to eat if you don't like what's going on in the lunchroom. Oh, buck it up. Or that other girl didn't mean it. You're being too sensitive. Then they quit telling you at all because nobody's listening. They also have learned that, and we've taught them, that it's part of growing up. And it's not. It should never be a part of any childhood. Uh, and then um, they have uh, uh, also understood that adults can bully. Uh, and so they have no advocacy in the setting where the bullying is occurring. So that's why they don't wanna tell us. So when your child comes to you, what do you do, what not to do? You'll see on the handout of what not to do and what to do. And let's look at what not to do. Don't minimize, rationalize, or explain it away. Don't rush in to solve it. You'll make it worse because the child will stop telling you um, and it could bring about some retaliation. Don't tell um, the child uh, to fight back. It's not a fight. Bullies are cowards. They're not ignorant. They picked on somebody they knew they could get. And often it's with hurtful words. And we see young people strike out. Uh, and then we say, well, look, it's a fight. No, we have to understand that when somebody calls somebody a gross name and the other kid strikes back, that is not a conflict. That is a kid who can't take it anymore. Um, and then uh, don't tell them um, that, uh, that in the sense that when you say to fight back, that this is something you have to handle alone. No. Say to them, I hear you, I'm here for you, I believe you, you're not in this alone. Bullies try to isolate a kid and make them feel alone. So we as parents and our, as I work with teachers, I try to say, you have to say to that kid, I hear you, I'm here for you, I believe you, you're not in this alone. Second, it's not your fault. The yes, your kid may be weird, dorky, odd, they have ADHD, Asperger's, missed social cues, be going through a rough time with cancer treatment, nothing justifies mean, nothing. And so we need to make sure it stays on the person doing the tormenting. Now, if there are some social issues your child has to deal with and like, yes, but nothing justifies the mean that was done to them. It's not your fault. Then we need to say to them, there are things you can do. And that's what we teach kids. If it's verbal bullying, how to stand up to that. If it's social or relational bullying, which is very difficult, um, it, especially with our young girls, it just basically makes them feel totally inadequate and totally helpless. And when you see the body posture like that, we need to help them say, I'll find another place to eat lunch. And that's where we have to have those brave hearted kid willing to stand up uh, for a kid who's been targeted. It helps if you're not alone. Um, and then you want to say to them, there are people you can tell. And you need to check in your school. If you suspect your child's being targeted, what are you gonna do? Uh, as you talk to the administrator and say, this is what's happening, or to the teacher, this is what's happening. This is what's happening to my child who's doing it. And the impact it's had on that, my child. And I need to know, number one, how you're going to help keep her safe. And number two, what tools can you give us that we can work on at home to help her be able to stand up to this bullying? And third, what are you going to do with the kid who did it to her? How are you gonna hold them accountable? Far too often, kids who bully are accommodated with conflict resolution, which never works in bullying, or they're excused for their behavior while well, he has some issues himself. No, mean and cruel. The child needs to be held accountable for that. And then we have to let them know who it's safe to tell. And you have to say, who can my child go to and know it's safe harbor for them in the school? Um, and so we have to be sure that we do our part if our child is being targeted. And it's so important that we impress on the teachers that we're here and that mean and cruel will not be tolerated. We will work with our child if they have done the tar targeting. And I got to tell you, unless they were mean and cruel before they got the cancer, the chances of them being mean and cruel when they have cancer is very small. So they may be striking out, they may be angry and frustrated, and teachers need to be clued in. So that's a possibility. But all they have to do is watch the body language. A kid who strikes back is often got an angry or sad face. There's no smirk on their face. 
So we need to be able to address that. Now, as we look at that, um, I'd like you to uh, talk to your young people about what conflict means and what bullying means. And five-year-olds get it. If your child's older, to be able to address it and then say to them, what can you say if somebody mocks you? And remember, don't say teases you because teasing is a mutual thing. But if they mock you or they taunt you, what can you say and what can you do? And if you still think it won't stop or you're afraid to speak up, who can you tell where you feel safe? And you have to have dialogue with the school because every kid needs to know that this place is a safe place to be. Bullying, again, is about mean and cruel and should never be tolerated. I'm open to questions. I know I went a long time, but I'm certainly open to some questions here. Hi, Barbara. Thank you so much for that talk. It's very relatable, I think, Good. for everybody. I, I can relate to some of that uh, <laughs> from my own life. You know? now, bullying happens at all ages. All That's ages what well. elder abuse is. Yeah. It's bullying. Yeah, yeah. Spousal That's abuse true. That's true. is bullying. It's criminal bullying, but it's bullying. It is, it is absolutely. And I could relate to it on my personal level from when I was in school and with my own daughter, with the relational and the verbal with the girls. Yeah, <laughs> I get yes. it personally. Yes. So that's, that's great. Thank you. I hope a lot of parents and educators also uh, listen to this, see this recording, listen to your talk. I, I was wondering, do you think it's changed, it's improved over time in schools? Um, how they react to bullying. Um, has it gotten better? I, you know, there's all these anti-bullying assemblies and programs. Is that all just talk, love, or is it like, how um, you I'm asked that question a whole lot. And yes, it's gotten better because of our awareness of what bullying is and what it isn't and the devastation that it can wreak. And yes, it's gotten worse. And why has it gotten worse? The online, offline have merged to become the real world for our young people. And there's one other reason. The climate, the political, the socioeconomic, the community climate that our children are living in today uh, is very difficult to combat. How do we respond to those who think differently than we do? How do we respond to those um, who have a different uh, philosophy than we do. Um, and, and we have to be open to that, but we again not, do not need to tolerate mean and cruel in our lives. And it, uh, let me give you an example. Um, at the family gathering, uh, you know, bullying, we all have people in our family tree that are mean and cruel. <laughs> Some just aren't on the uh, family tree yet. They're at the dinner table spewing bigoted comments thinly disguised as jokes. Mm -hmm. Now you as a parent have an obligation to let your children know that you're gonna handle this as uncomfortable it is. You want your kid to be brave hearted? You gotta be brave hearted and say, that was mean and cruel, that was bigoted, that was racist. I'm uncomfortable with that comment. When all the other relatives roll their eyes and say, what can't you take a joke? Not that kind. And you know you've had an impact when you walk back into the dining room and everybody shuts up, but you've had an impact on your children. And when your mother, who will be very upset with you, or maybe wishes she had said something because she's had to put up with it for so long, maybe it's a sibling of hers who's bullying. Um, and because uh, siblings bully, siblings can bully too. It's a devastating thing. And some do it well into old age. Uh, and you don't need to put up with it. You don't need to, to take that kind of abuse. But if she says, well, you know, Uncle George is old. Old is never excuse for mean. Um, and if she says, but he's old and uh, you have to be able to, to just go with the flow on that. And you can say, no, I don't want my children to ever believe at any age, it's okay to make those kind of racist or sexist or bigoted comments. Now, people may be upset with you, but your children have witnessed you standing up when it's uncomfortable. Chances of them being that brave-hearted kid has been radically increased because they've seen you taking a hit for standing up and speaking out. 
Someone had a question. I saw that. Yes, Sam had a question. She says, what would you suggest for kids who have been told by another parent that hitting is okay? The parent is no longer around, but that comment lingers with them even when they are quite young. Yes. Um, hitting just gets you in trouble. <laughs> There's a wonderful children's book by Trevor Romaine. He's a wonderful author. He wrote, Bullies are a Pain in the Brain. And he said, if it looks scary, run. You'll look silly, but you'll look alive. Uh, and bullies remember are cowards. They tend to gather others around and they look for someone who's alone. Um, and your child needs to understand, defend yourself. There's a difference between a defensive move and an offensive move. Offensive is going to get you in trouble. It's kind of like in basketball. They don't see the foul. They see the other person hitting back at the foul. And who gets the penalty? The person hitting back. Um, and so you don't want that. And besides, your kid has to be accountable for their behavior. But yes, is there a time to defend yourself? Absolutely. But remember, verbal bullying is most common. So giving them some good verbal comebacks. Not it takes one to know one. That's aggressive. You don't want to be aggressive. That begets more aggression. You don't want to be passive. That's invites it. Please stop. That hurts. But you want to be able to be assertive, to be able to roll your shoulders around and down and speak with a strong voice to practice that. That was mean and cruel. I don't need this. I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. um, and now there are four antidotes that we can help develop in all of our children. One is a strong sense of self. And a strong sense of self isn't a big ego. Bullies have big egos. They inflate that ego by deflating other human beings. But a strong sense of self is that I, thou, and our common humanity that Martin Buber talked about. I'm unique. I have special things in my life. I have gifts and talents. I have this, uh, uh, I may have cancer that makes me unique in a special way. However, the other child is also unique and we have a common humanity. We are interdependent, interrelated, and interconnected, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu said. And the more we can help our young people see that strong sense of self in relation to others and themselves individually, the I and thou are, are individual, the common humanity is the we. Um, being able to uh, make friends means they also, number three, can be a good friend. It's important that we teach our kids good friendship skills. And this is where online and offline uh, attacks can, under the, the call of friends, I have 500 friends, who has 500 friends? You know, that's not a friend kind of thing, but truly teaching them what it means to be a friend. Um, and, and actually Trevor, I'm, I'm pushing his books here, obviously. Trevor Romaine has another one, Clicks Phonies, another baloney. And I borrowed from him with his permission the basic steps of friendship, uh, because it's the best I've seen and just being a good friend and how to make a friend. And the last is teaching young people how to get into a group and when to get out. When all the girls say, we're not gonna eat lunch with the new girl for so that your daughter to be able to stand up to that. Hmm. And often it's an interesting thing. I saw it with my own daughter who had cancer um, is she was standing up for more people. She was always good at, at stray cats and stray people, you know, but after her cancer, it was like she had a real awakening uh, to the vulnerabilities of her own body and other people's vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and she invited her friends who had been lifeguards with her uh, to come in with their clown noses and entertain the kids on the cancer ward because she was three weeks away from being an adult. So she was in the children's ward. And I was so grateful for that because they handle it so differently than when you're an adult. Mm -hmm. And she had her friends there doing those kinds of things. And, and as I have said before, um, she would not go to a support group. So the doctor very wisely said, I'd like you to help with a support group for, for younger kids. And in the end, she benefited greatly from that. Um, we need to be able to help one another. There are three antidotes to the three most virulent agents ripping apart the fa fabric of our humanity, hating other human beings, with utter contempt, hoarding me, mine, and more instead of us, ours, and enough, and harming through lying and cheating and stealing. Uh, so what would be the antidotes? If every day you can help all of your children care more deeply, again, it's not liking somebody, it's that sense of 
relieving their suffering and wishing them well, care more deeply about others, share more generously of their talents, their gifts, um, and uh, the resources that they possess, and to help more willingly. And one of the things I, I have found with any child who is going through what is a catastrophic loss, a diagnosis of cancer, is getting out and helping others. I say the same thing about kids who have been targeted. Um, I had a parent come up to me who said, we've got him in a different school. We've done all of these kinds of things for him. We got him counseling. What more can we do? I said, what's he doing? She said, oh, but he was targeted. I said, precisely. What's he doing to help himself heal? Is he working in a soup kitchen, Habitat for Humanity, a nursery? Getting out and giving to others is one of the most healing things we can do for one another. That's great. Thank you. And I yep. do have another question. Okay. It's not on, it was sent to me by mistake uh, directly, but she said I could share it. Um, my eldest child has been on her journey with an eating disorder. Her fear is going back to school and how she will be perceived by her peers. She's been bullied in the past. She's not my cancer child, but did begin showing a lot of different signs after her sister's diagnosis. Yes. Um, and not uncommon, by the way. I had our, our, our son did some interesting things with his hair and those who know my work know if it's not life-threatening, morally threatening or unhealthy, let it go. But he had this great need to wake my husband and I up to, hello, I'm still here. And that's not uncommon. And so we have to tune in and let others help out. Uh, a dear friend of mine who had breast cancer could relate to my daughter and I just thought I have to do it. Now there's a time someone else can help you out and you can be there to that soccer game and the like. So it's so important that we recognize our other children are still there and we might see these kinds of things come up. And what we can say to her is the six critical life messages I say to any child every day. I believe in you. I trust in you. I know you can handle this. You're listened to you're cared for and you're very important to me. And yes, we can do this together and talk to me. Obviously the, the young person's been able to talk about her fears she has of going back to school. And it is a difficult time, but if she's been targeted, she's more vulnerable to being targeted again. And what we have to do as educators is be aware of that. It's important that the, the parent lets the, because they, everybody else in the school might think, oh, the one child has cancer. So these others uh, are doing fine. No, this daughter is struggling. And I need you to know that um, she needs to be uh, watched, that if somebody's being mean, can she come to you? Every kid has somebody different. One of the kids I was working with, it was the janitor he could go to, because that's who he felt the safest with. Why? The janitor spoke Spanish as his first language. And he understood the child who spoke Spanish as his first language. So it was special ed teacher, uh, the, the nurse. Uh, I say, who is safe harbor for you? Um, and that's the teacher or the, the nurse or the counselor that we'll go to. Is there a, a thing that can trigger something? Can you go then to see them in the middle of the day? Because we're here for you. Mm, if, we, you. If, we, if teachers, I'm a teacher. If somebody doesn't tell me, uh, it happens so often under the radar that it's helpful if I know. Thank you. And I did have one more question that was submitted in advance. And the mom wanted to know, do you have any tips for parents that have themselves been shaken by their own childhood cancer experience or other past traumas, how to overcome their sensitivities and regulate their reactions or help when helping children through a bullying experience? Yes. Um, anyone who's been uh, very intimately affected by any kind of trauma, um, we need to honor the trauma, call it by name, and say this is real. It happened. Notice I said happened, past tense, to me. It is a thread in my tapestry, an ugly thread in the tapestry of my life. And I need to make sure that I'm dealing with it effectively. If I need to get help to get the help I need, for my sake and my child's sake. So we don't cover everything with my trauma and um, influence what's going on in my child's life. Bullying impacts all of us when it's our kid. 
And if our kid has a cancer diagnosis or our kid has been targeted in school, it cuts to the core of who we are because we want desperately to protect our children. But if we ourselves have trauma, then it's important that we call it by name and we get the help we need. There's so much help today. I, I go back to, to uh, the swimmer, Michael Phelps. Uh, Phelps, Phelps like yes, him. Michael Phelps, who honored the fact that he had been targeted horribly as a child for his body shape, which helped him win gold. He has a dolphin-like body, very long torso and not as long of legs. And he was mocked for that and his ears, um, horribly targeted. And it was never addressed fully. His swimming is how he worked on it. But he found as an adult that he needed therapy. Um, and he's so grateful for it. He's on TV talking very openly about it um, because he didn't want it to impact his children's life. Um, it's always going to be that thread, an ugly thread, but it doesn't have to define how we relate to our children. So get the help you need. It's okay. Um, and if you feel like you, can, you can't handle it all at once, it's okay to ask someone who's survived cancer. It's okay to ask um, someone who's going through it with their own children uh, to help out right now, or for a relative who um, has a bit of distance and yet is very close to the child to, to lend some support. We all need support. We're all in this together. Uh, and uh, to honor, but first you have to honor it. You have to say this ugly, ugly thing happened to me. I'm not honoring what happened to you, but I'm honoring the fact it happened to you. And then recognize that if it's getting in the way of me being effectively able to relate to my children or to deal with what they're going through, then I need to get help. Very important, thank you. And um, before we go, I just wanted to see if anyone else had any other questions for Barbara. You can turn on your camera if you want or write it in the chat. You can also send an email. It's info.kidsareworthit at gmail.com. Uh, and uh, send me an email. I don't always get to it in a day, but you can do it. Also go to our website and download the handouts. They're free. It's right on the front page, the bullying handout that was written. Uh, that's a summary of the book because when you're in the midst of cancer treatment and you're in the midst of getting kids back into off of virtual learning and in-person learning, and you're also concerned about kids who aren't vaccinated yet because they can't be, um, this is a very quick guide. Thank you, and make sure your website is kidsareworthit.com. I'm just writing in the chat yeah, the email, and kidsareworthit.com. There's a lot of important information on there, resources and handouts, and uh, also, I have to plug OPAC. OPAC also provides that peer-to-peer -peer support specifically for child cancer parents with their parent liaisons every Tuesday at 7.30, uh, virtually like this with uh, Susan, Karen, and Michelle. So also check out our website at OPAC, opacc.org for a lot of resources there as well. And thank you so much again, Barbara. Wonderful. Oh, thank you for having me. It's just been a real joy. I'm looking forward to getting to Canada soon. Uh, I'll be going open the, well yeah you can come here but we can't go down there yeah. yet so no, fully vaccinated for those of you who know I have the alpha enzyme deficiency compliments my father I inherited it that I was eligible for the booster and my antibodies seem to be building up so I'm ready Good. to Good get out on the road to work yeah, so, that's great. Thank you. but I love the virtual too yeah you can reach so you know, many you know people yes. here so. And I'm going to go right. down and have dinner with my husband, <laughs> who has everything turned off so we had enough speed on the internet. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you again. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thanks Good for night. having me. Thanks. Good night.